Uh, we feature a wide variety of speakers and topics that's related to our rich heritage here. Uh, today we delve into the earth below us and a history that re you know, reaches way back into unrecorded history, uh, the geology of Western Washington. It's a history that affects us in many ways today though, so that's what drew the crowd, I think. Our program features a person from the Washington Department of Natural Resources, Karina Forson, and I got to experience her illustrated talk right here in this very room earlier this year as she spoke to the South Sound Heritage Association. So I can give her rave reviews and you're gonna have a good program here. In fact, so much so that I had to include her in our history talk series today. And I should mention that if she doesn't mention earthquakes, it isn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> But it's more than earthquakes and volcanoes. Uh, we're going to learn about how the land beneath us was formed and give us some good advice on how to prepare for possible geologic ev events in the future. So let's give a warm local history welcome to Karina Forsen. Thank you, and thanks for coming to learn about Washington geology. As Don mentioned, my name is Karina Forsen. I'm the chief hazards geologist for the Washington Geological Survey, which is a di uh, division of the Department of Natural Resources. And we are located at the Natural Resources Building on the Capitol campus. We have a geology library there that's open to the public, so if anyone's interested in the material I present today, or if the handouts and the cool volcano postcards and posters that I brought here run out and you want one, feel free to come on down to the Washington Geology Library and peruse our collection and grab some cool swag. Um, at any time, we're open, or the library's open Monday through Thursday, eight to five, so it's a great resource if you don't know about it. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the geology of Washington, a very, very abbreviated history. <laughs> um, and then I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what we do at the Washington Geological Survey, and in particular, geologic hazards. Um, so since I've got a loaded talk, I ask that you save your questions till the end. So as I mentioned, this is a braided stream channel, and um, the way that we're able to see this is through a technology called LIDAR, light detection and ranging. And so it allows us to see through the trees and to see the ground, what we call the bare earth. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that because it's really revolutionized geology and understanding of topography in Washington and all around the world. So this is very hard to see at this scale, but this is a, geo a detailed geologic map of Washington state. The different colors on the map represent different rock types. And so um, how geologists understand the different geologic hazards and history of volcanic activity and major faults um, is through mapping different rock types. So where is there basalt on the surface? Where, is there, where are there glacial deposits? Where are there old metamorphic rocks? And so each different rock type is symbolized by a different color. And there's a legend on the right hand side. And so you might notice that a lot of the map is brown. In Washington, brown is the symbol for the youngest geologic rock rocks from the Quaternary, so that's 2.6 million years old to the present. And in Puget Sound, um, this brown color is the symbol for glacial deposits. So much of our geology here in the Puget Sound is shaped by a glacier that was here about 19,000 years ago. And I'll go into much more detail about that later. And so, um, as I mentioned, the photos on the right are examples of what glaciers look like and how they carve and form our landscape. And then much of our, of our Washington geology that we see today is also shaped by a volcano. So that's why we have this picture of Mount Rainier here. So this is, describes how Washington has been accreted or how terrains have been added from east to west over time. The Earth is about 4.2 billion years old. The oldest rocks in Washington are only about 750 million years old. The geology of Washington is a result of complex history of tectonic events. Um, it's a combination of various terrains, these different um, regions of Earth that are, have been accreted or added over time. And the terrains of Washington we see today resulted from continental evolution where pieces of ancient continents, hundreds of millions of years old, have broken off and reattached to form different continents. So as I said, Washington grew from east to west and the ocean shoreline migrated over millions of years from Spokane to where it currently is today. Mm -hmm. um, so the rest of this presentation will go over some of the most significant changes in Washington geology, but 
I don't have 750 million years to tell you all the details. And I don't think anyone would want that. <laughs> so um, some of the oldest rocks in Washington are the North Cascades. And for any of you that have ever been hiking in the North Cascades, you know that they're very dramatic. And there's lots of different um, colors and different um, types of rocks that you can sort of just see from the untrained eye. And so um, the older rocks in Washington um, in the North Cascades are these older metamorphic rocks. And metamorphic rocks refer to rocks that have been changed from temperature and pressure. So whether that's from being buried deep underground and having lots of sediment piled on top of it, or whether it's from continental collision or this um, process of moving rocks through um, faulting or folding, this is how we get metamorphic rocks. Um, and so the rocks in the North Cascade Range are over 400 million years old, and they've been scraped off and smashed together, folded and buried, faulted and moved, finally making their way to uh, their present position in Western Washington. Um, so after this chaotic assembly happened, over the series of 400 million years, um, a chain of volcanoes grew and erupted as the subduction zone, which I'll talk about later, um, was uh, created this volcanic chain. So the volcanoes that we know and love in Washington um, are much, much younger, only about 37 million years old. And they are sort of piled on top of this old, ancient, metamorphic terrain in the North Cascades. So here you can see the younger volcanic rocks outlined in black, that's Mount Baker, piled on top of these older 400 or so million year old metamorphic rocks. So this is a map on the right that shows, it's a, obviously a cartoon that shows um, where the coastline was about 55 million years ago. So now we're jumping way forward <laughs> in geologic time. Um, so about 55 million years ago, um, Olympia was under the ocean. There was, we were under the sea. Um, and there was a coastal plain that um, spans what we know and love of the Cascades today. So as the coastline moved west and new rocks were smashed onto Washington, the landscape continued to go change and evolve. Um, so as I said, about 55 million years ago, the coast of Washington was inland from where it was, and older volcanoes that have long since been buried under the current landscape um, were depositing massive amounts of sediments that were getting carried out onto the coastal plain and under the ocean. Um, during this time, large, large rivers flowed from east to west and deposited much of the coal-bearing deposits mined in Washington in the 1990s. Um, so the Seattle and Bellingham area would have looked like a swamp, and different creatures roamed the planet then. So this picture on top is probably what it looked like about 55 million years ago in Seattle and Washington, or excuse me, Bellingham. Um, and so these peaty bogs and marshy, this landscape is what was ultimately buried and created the the coal that we mined in Washington um, in the 1990s and still today in some places. It's a little bit slow to change slides. One second. As the continent continued to grow and change, the Columbia River basalts started erupting about 17 million years ago as a series of flood basalts that cover much of southwest Washington. So the picture in the top right is a photo of um, Hawaii. This is what we call a fissure eruption, where you have fissures in the earth that spew lava and cover the ground in these massive blankets of lava. And this is much like what we envision for the Columbia River basalt deposition. It's not necessarily large stratovolcanoes like we have today, but a series of fissures and smaller vents that deposited massive amounts of lava that covered all of western Washington, Oregon, parts of Idaho, um, as the map shows on the, your far right. These are all different um, formations of the Columbia River basalt group. And so much of eastern and southeastern Washington are shaped by the Columbia River basalts. Um, and these are, um, you, you, can you can recognize them by the columnar basalts, um, as the image in the middle there shows, and the top, um, which form is the basalt cools. It's a really cool, really cool cooling mechanism. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and this is also where um, old 
forests were buried under these um, different lava flows. And so this is ginkgo petrified forest in eastern Washington. So this is what a ginkgo tree looks like. And these ancient ginkgo trees were buried under these lavas and petrified. And so we have ancient petrified forests um, that are from about 17 million years ago as these um, eruptions happened and blanketed the landscape. And so over the last 37 million years, the Cascade Volcanic Arc has been erupting a chain of volcanoes that follows the modern arc we see today. The five big stratovolcanoes we are familiar with, Baker, Glacier Peak, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, and Mount Adams are the result of a renewed episode of volcanic eruptions which began about 75,000 years ago and generated multiple eruptions throughout the Cascades to this day. Evidence of repeated eruptions from these volcanoes exists in the geologic record. As I showed you in the map before, we see different deposits that were able to use different chemistry to date these and understand that they came from the same source. Um, and then, of course, from as recently as 1980 and then the rebuilding episode in 2004 and 2008 at Mount St. Helens. Um, so from Mount Baker to Mount St. Helens, each volcano has a dynamic history and they're all still active today. So that's a question that I get quite often in my email and on the phone. Does Washington have any active volcanoes? Um, <laughs> yes, we do. We have five active volcanoes. Um, and they keep me awake at night. Um, <laughs> and I'll talk to you a little bit more about volcanic hazards um, afterwards. But it's important to realize that these volcanoes, like I said, are just uh, the most recent period in our volcanic history in Washington. And the location of these volcanoes, I don't know if you have ever looked at a map and thought, they're quite in a line. <laughs> um, and that's because um, we have a complicated subduction zone offshore. This is a graphic that shows it as the oceanic plate is being pushed underneath and pulled underneath the continental plate. Um, the plate dewaters and melts and there's a lot of complicated um, geochemistry that goes on but ultimately the oceanic plate melts and it, as it melts it gets hot and it bubbles up and it creates these chain of volcanoes and that's why they're in a line because they are the result of the subduction process um, and the melting oceanic plate that's being subducted underneath the continental arc. So that's pretty cool. And so subduction is really driving a lot of the geology in, in Washington state. Um, the Olympic Mountains are created because of subduction. The, the terrain on the oceanic plate, some of it got scraped off and pushed up to build the Olympic Mountains and then it got folded and faulted and it's being, it's being uplifted at an incredible rate. But there's so much erosion that's happening in the Olympics that it's it's equaling out. But if there wasn't so much rain and erosion, the Olympic Mountains could be taller than Mount Everest and the Himalayas because they're being uplifted in such an incredible rate. It's pretty remarkable. Um, and so this diagram here shows um, our different earthquake sources. Um, so this subduction process is also what causes some of our major earthquakes. So how many of you read the New Yorker article or heard about it, full rip 9.0? <laughs> Um, so that one was a little, <laughs> it's good to get people interested in earthquakes and it's also, in my mind, it was a little alarmist. So I, I don't think that everything west of I-5 will be toast, but um, <laughs> we will have quite, we will have our hands full, that's for sure. Um, and so this picture here depicts the Juan de Fuca plate, the oceanic plate getting subducted underneath the continental plate. And so we have subduction zone earthquakes that cause the big magnitude nine earthquakes that we're worried about that could generate um, you know, some of our biggest earthquake hazards. And the length of the fault is really what determines the magnitude it's capable of. So the subduction zone um, reaches from Mendocino in Northern California all the way up through Canada. So it's a very long, complicated fault system. And that's why it's capable of producing a large magnitude nine earthquake. Um, and then we have crustal faults. Um, it's hard to see here, but like the Seattle fault, the Tacoma fault, the Southern Whidbey Island fault, they're not all shown on this map. Um, but these are crustal faults that are the result of um, the different terrains and different rock types sort of creaking and moving in response to this complicated subduction and um, plate rotation. And these faults are capable of producing, you know, magnitude 7, 
five earthquakes. And they're really dangerous because they're situated where our population centers are, and they can create shaking in these basins that surround where our major cities and um, people live. And then we also have these deep earthquakes that are deep, deep, deep in the subduction zone um, that we can also feel. And these are earthquakes like the one that happened here in 1949, 1965, and the Nisqually earthquake in 2001. So we have three different sources for earthquakes in Washington. Right. And then um, now I'm going to go through, I'm skipping way forward in time now, we're in the glacial, we're in the Quaternary, the most recent chapter of Washington's geologic history. Um, so the Quaternary is a geologic time um, period and this spans from 2.6 million years ago to the present. And during this time the northern hemisphere excuse me, was plunged into a series of ice ages. Um, and all the while, volcanoes continued to erupt. Both processes deposited new soil that many of us live on. Um, and during this time, at least four major ice advances covered much of Washington, thousands of feet thick. So during non-glacial glacial intervals, when there was no ice covering Washington, it looked this is a graphic depicting sort of what it looks like. Um, the climate was much like that of today with evergreens, Douglas firs, spruce, and lodgepole pines. Um, and so right now, as you can imagine, we're living in a non-glacial period because we're not covered in ice. So that works out well for us. <laughs> and then as the ice begins to arrive due to changes in climate, um, <coughs> we see that the glaciers drastically change the environment. Um, voluminous sediment is shed from the meltwater streams at the front of the glacier as it advances, um, and it buries and destroys old forests. So geologists occasionally find wood and plant material within the sand and gravel deposits from these glaciers. And then we use a process called radiocarbon dating, looking at the carbon in the wood that was buried um, to date these organic materials that help us tell the time of the ice arrival at that location. So by understanding the amount of um, sand and gravel and their orientation and different, um, different geomorphology and different types of um, deposits, we're able to tell if it was the ice advance or the ice retreat or some period in between. And that can tell us about the, um, what time the ice arrived and what time it left and what the conditions were like at that time. So that's how we know about the glacial history in this area. And so the glacier here on the left continues to advance at a glacial pace. Um, as the ice advance further, low-lying areas are inundated with meltwater and fine-grained silts and clays, occasionally, again, trapping organic material ripped up by the glacier. These glacial lakes um, were created as the glacier advanced and retreated. And again, radiocarbon analysis of these organic materials indicates when the ice was nearby. And then we have our glacial maximum, so when the ice extent was at its furthest, um, for this location south, and I'll show you a map of this um, next, but um, these glacial lake deposits may be very thick as the glacial lakes would have persisted in the landscape for tens to thousands of years, um, occasionally accumulating silt and clay from the front or the sides of the glacier. And then the climate changes again, and the glacier starts to retreat. And this happens, you have advances and retreats, advances and retreats, um, and so as the climate warms, the ice begins to waste away rapidly, leaving behind a complex dynamic environment and occasionally leaving behind large blocks of ice like the one depicted here. And these are how our kettle lakes are formed. So all surrounding Washington, or the glacial geology of Washington and southern Puget Sound and Olympia in particular, we have lots of these small round kettle lakes and you'll see them all around this area. And these are formed um, by, bur by buried ice chunks that are left by the retreating glacier. So sediment transported in the meltwater streams often buried these blocks of ice in place and the ice would take its sweet time melting up to thousands of years sometimes um, beneath this insulating layer of sand and gravel. And then eventually some of these are smaller and they, the water didn't remain and so they left behind depressions um, and then the plants and trees um, got trapped in there and they, you would have peat bogs. So some of the peat bogs we see are from these kettle deposits. And so a radiocarbon analysis from these peat bogs tells geologists when the ice left the area. 
And so modern day, we find organic material in old lakes and old peat bogs and different um, buried in different sediment layers. And this helps us to discover the glacial history of our area. And so this is a map on the left um, showing you contours of approximate ice thickness in feet at our glacial maximum um, during what we call the Vashon stage. Um, so from about 19,000 to 16,000 years ago, um, the glacial ice sheet was at its maximum. So it was at this extent. Um, this means it reached as far south as Tenino and was about 3,000 feet thick near Seattle, enough to cover the Space Needle five times. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so during this period, about 19,000, 16,000 years ago, creatures such as mammoths, saber-toothed cats, and ground sloths lived and died um, in this area as um, with the changes in climate. And so scientists know about the climate of the past by studying ice cores um, and by mapping glacial deposits. So glaciers leave marks on the landscape. Uh, many of the small lakes people swim in are formed by glaciers. The rivers today follow paths of glacial outwash channels um, formed thousands of years ago. And the hills and depressions in the landscape are likely formed by ice and glaciers eroding and depositing massive amounts of rocks and soil. Um, so this um, is a simplified image of the glacial ice extent in Washington at glacial maximum. And up on the top, there's um, just a few images of some glacial features. So lateral moraines are the sides or the deposits on the sides of glaciers. We get those today if you have ever been up to Mount Rainier and the Nisqually Glacier. Um, when you drive up, you can see beautiful moraines there. Those are the deposits from the sides of the glacier. Um, came in kettle topography, as I mentioned, the kettle lakes. Um, and then you have different outwash channels, like that first um, image I showed was different braided stream and outwash channels. And so we can see that at even a larger scale from these um, glacial outwash channels from major rivers that drain these glaciers. Um, so during the last ice age, one lobe of the ice sheet formed an ice dam and blocked a major river, the Clark Fork in Montana. This created a huge glacial lake, Glacial Lake Missoula. It was 200 miles long and over 2,000 feet deep, and it's depicted in the map in the upper right here. Over the course of 2,000 years, the ice dam failed repeatedly, rapidly emptying the contents of the lake. The floods that came from the dam breach swept across Washington and into Oregon and all the way out to the ocean. <coughs> The flood waters left scars on the landscape and formed some beautiful river channels, such as the one shown here, um, scab lands, and giant ripple marks as hints to future geologists about the dynamic history of the flooding that occurred here in the past. And so I'm going to show you just a quick history um, of the dam breach. So it's, it's hard probably for most of you to see in the back there, but up in the upper right, there's a red circle that says ice dam, and there's glacial lake Missoula in blue. And so the ice dam broke or melted, and then the meltwater started to travel west and eventually covered what we now call the channeled scab lands, filling into the Columbia River down into Oregon. It's quite remarkable. <laughs> So we're lucky enough to live in a state that has a landscape carved by geology. The beautiful volcanoes that dot our skyline are the result of subduction. The glaciers that cover them remind us of the giant ice sheets that existed here thousands of years ago and carved the Puget Sound. Floodwaters covered our state as the ice sheet retreated and formed beautiful waterfalls and river canyons. The rugged mountains teach us about the building of our state many millions of years ago, and the recent volcanic eruptions and volcanic mud flows remind us that we live in a dynamic world that is active and ever-changing. So now I'm going to switch gears a little and tell you about um, the Washington Geological Survey and what we do and talk to you a little bit about geologic hazards. So at the Washington Geological Survey, we um, study geologic and environmental hazards. We conduct geologic mapping to continue understanding the history of geology in Washington. Um, we're regulation and resources for aggregates and for mining. Um, we collect publications. We produce publications. We have more data than you can imagine. And we do public outreach. And then, we, as I mentioned, we also have the Washington Geology Library. 
Um, so this is an example. This is our website. This is a screenshot of our website. We have a really cool website, um, and we worked really hard on it. So we'd love it if you checked it out and um, navigated it, and let us know if you have any questions or if you're looking for something in particular. On the top of our website, it says, "Here's where you can contact us for more information." So if you can't find what you want to know, please let us know so we can make our website better. We also have a really cool geologic information portal. If you click that link, the geologic information portal has most of the information that we provide to you. So it gives you geologic mapping, it gives you earthquake hazard information, tsunami inundation, evacuation routes, where are there minerals, where are there hot springs in Washington? We have that data on here if you're looking for hot springs. Um, where are there, where is there radon? Anything that you're interested in geology, um, you can find it on our map. On our, on our portal. Um, and you can also type in your address. So if you're interested, if you live in a tsunami inundation zone, um, you can type in your address and turn on the tsunami layer and it'll tell you. Um, so you can also look at if you're in an earthquake hazard area or what the local geology is where you live, you can click on the different layers and it'll show you, oh, that's a quaternary glacial deposit. And you'll say, I went to a talk about that and they told me what glacial deposits are. <laughs> And for those of you that have smartphones and you're interested, um, we have a mobile app also that has this information. So as you're traveling around Washington and you want to know, what is that mountain made of? Or, gee, these rocks are really cool. I wish I knew. Um, it'll show you where you are. And you can click on the map, and it'll show you what the geologic deposit is in that area. So that's pretty cool. You can Google it, Washington Geology app, or you can go to our website and try and find it there. So now I'm going to talk to you about um, geologic hazards and understanding risk. Um, so this is an example of a LIDAR image that lets us strip away the vegetation like you can see in the north and south. Um, this is a fault scarp from the Seattle Fault on Bainbridge Island. So you can see it just ripping across from east to west. So we're really close to downtown Seattle here, for those of you that don't know about Bainbridge Island. Um, it's just right across the waterway there. Um, and the Seattle Fault last ruptured around um, AD 1930. And so not that long ago, we had a major earthquake, about a 7, 7.5, on the Seattle Fault, which today would just devastate much of Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, and cause a tsunami that travels all up and down the Puget Sound. So understanding these earthquake hazards and their recurrence and what that means for people that live, work, and play in these areas is a big part of what we do. Um, so geologic risk is defined as the combination of a, the hazards. So is it an earthquake hazard? Is it a tsunami hazard? Is it a volcano hazard? Um, the vulnerability. So just like people say, if a, you know, if something happens in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, did it happen? Um, so if we have, if we don't have any people nearby, does it really matter if there's an earthquake? You know. So that's the vulnerability, and then the value. So what? What do we have that's near there? Do we have major transportation corridors? Do we have major cities? Do we have ports? Do we have harbors? Um, so those three combined um, define risk. That's what we're concerned with. Um, so we're looking at risk analysis. So what hazards exist? What is their likelihood? And what are their consequences? Luckily for us, the consequence of geologic disasters are inversely proportional to their frequency. So we have small earthquakes every day but most people don't ever feel them. But we don't have big earthquakes very often. And so um, the big events are pretty infrequent, but the frequent events are usually pretty small. So that's good for us when we're looking <laughs> and trying to understand risk. So we have to look at benefit cost analysis. So this is an example um, of, in I don't know how many people have heard of this, Ocosta Elementary School out on Westport in Washington is the first tsunami vertical evacuation structure in the nation. Um, so we're really proud of that. Um, they were building a new gym at the Ocosta School, and they're in the tsunami zone. And they weren't able to move the school outside of the tsunami zone, so they decided that they would um, put out a bond and leverage money from the community and build a vertical evacuation structure on top of their gym. 
Um, and so the cost of the vertical evacuation structure was $2 million, and 1,000 people can take refuge there. So the benefit-cost analysis for that was pretty no-brainer in their minds, right? Um, and so if you think about it, FEMA considers our lives to be worth $6.3 million. So um, trying to figure out these solutions, you know, how can we save people and do it um, in a way that makes sense for cost. Um, is, it's a hard problem because schools have a hard time getting money and making bonds and levies anyway, but this was something that the community thought was valuable, which I think was really a good success story. Um, so, as I mentioned, in Washington, we faced risk from faults and earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, and volcanic hazards. Um, we also have some risks from inactive and abandoned mines and hazardous minerals. Um, so right now I'm showing you a map that are the major faults, that, the major active faults that we think about in Washington State. Um, so there are many other faults that are not mapped here that are um, old faults that we don't have any evidence that they would rupture or create an earthquake anytime um, in the near future. But these are the faults that we worry about and that could cause earthquakes. And these are just the faults we know about. We discover new faults every year. As we get more and more LIDAR data and as we do more geologic mapping, we discover new faults all the time. So this is an ever-evolving science and um, this is why it's important to continue mapping geologic hazards. Um, and so an earthquake on the Seattle Fault is estimated to cost over $33 billion. It's not a small <laughs> number, um, and s over 61,000 people live in areas highly vulnerable to liquefaction. Liquefaction is what happens um, when you have these old river deposits or sediments or l engineered fill. Uh, oftentimes it's in low-lying areas and major river valleys. Do we ever build in low-lying yeah. areas or major river valleys? And so, <laughs> and so when an earthquake happens, it shakes, and it's kind of like a bowl of jello, or like when you go to the beach and you dig your toes in the sand and they sink into the wet sand. That's like what liquefaction does. And so we worry about that a lot um, during earthquakes in these major basins and river valleys um, <laughs> because a lot of times the buildings weren't engineered to deal with liquefaction or there wasn't mapping at the time that they were built that told them about the liquefaction hazard. Um, and so, for example, <laughs> this is a pretty scary fact, but um, the Cascadia subduction zone and the Seattle fault weren't incorporated in the Washington Building Code until 2004. So any building built before 2005 did not incorporate expected ground shaking from earthquakes from the Seattle Fault or the Cascadia subduction zone. So when we're looking at schools and we're looking at critical facilities and thinking about seismic upgrades, it's really important to think about the year built and what the expected shaking is. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a scary problem and something that we're just starting to scratch the surface of. <laughs> And so a magnitude 9 Cascadia earthquake is estimated to cost over $50 billion, um, and these large earthquakes recur every 200 to 1,000 years. The last one was in AD 1700, so that was 317 or 18 years ago now. Um, and so some people say we're due, um, but we are in the window when one could happen any day or it could happen 600 years from now. You know, we don't exactly know when the next major earthquake will happen, but that's why it's important to be prepared and to understand your earthquake risk and to have go bags in your car and to have supplies and water and food at your house so that if or when the next major earthquake happens and if we don't have access to transportation or food or you can't get to the grocery store or get water, you have those supplies at home and in your car um, so that you can at least survive for we say it would be two weeks ready is what we like to have people um, prepare for at their home. And so tsunamis um, are another major hazard in Washington state. Um, they can be generated locally or across the Pacific. So what I mean by that um, is we can have an earthquake on the Seattle Fault or the Cascadia subduction zone that causes a tsunami that a 
that reaches the coast in 10 minutes and reaches in the Puget Sound in two hours um, from a subduction zone earthquake. Um, or you can have a, an earthquake on a fault in Alaska, let's say, that travels all the way across the Pacific um, and reaches Washington in three hours or four hours or five hours. Um, and so we might have a little bit more time to prepare from an earthquake that happens in Alaska that, that will still tra channel um, the water and create some tsunami waves in Washington state. Um, and so this is a, a little bit of an outdated map that shows where we have detailed tsunami inundation modeling for Washington state. Um, so we're slowly chugging along trying to map the tsunami hazards in Washington, but it takes a lot of time and it's pretty computationally um, extensive and expensive. And so um, we're trying to understand tsunami hazards from um, tsunami dis that have happened in the past and from um, other tsunamis across the world and what we understand about wave dynamics. Um, so this is a little bit scary, but a, a tsunami from a Cascadia earthquake will hit the outer coast in 10 minutes and in some places be 50 or 60 feet deep. So um, when we're looking at vertical evacuation structures and um, people out on the outer coast, it's important to understand the hazard so we can start to come up with solutions. Um, the 2011 Tohoku, 2011 Tohoku tsunami in Japan cost over $300 billion in damage and there were over um, 15,000 fatalities. And the 2004 Sumatra earthquake and tsunami had you know, 200 plus thousand fatalities. So in Washington, um, we have 200,000 people that live in tsunami inundation zones plus um, excuse me, 50,000 plus, you know, greater than that during tourist season if this were to happen on a sunny day in the summer during clamming season or something. And so trying to get the message to people and explain to them the tsunami hazard without scaring them and just getting people aware of it and knowing what to do. Okay, so what do we do? Um, if there is an earthquake, if you feel an earthquake, get to high ground immediately. That's what we tell people. Um, the earthquake is your warning. We do have sirens on the outer coast that will alert people, um, but if it's an earthquake from Cascadia subduction zone or Seattle fault, the earthquake is your warning. Don't wait for the siren. <laughs> so after you finish drop covering and holding on and saving yourself from the earthquake, then we ask that you get to high ground as fast as you can. And again, check out our website and our portal to understand where there is a tsunami hazard and where the evacuation routes are. Um, but the simplest message is to get to high ground. So when you travel to the coast or when you're walking around, pay attention to your surroundings and notice where the highest ground is nearby. So this is a graphic that shows sort of what happens during a tsunami. Um, so this is pre-earthquake conditions on the top. So we have a beach and we have a shoreline, you're hanging out, it's beautiful. Um, then an earthquake happens. The way that subduction zone earthquakes happen, um, we anticipated there will be subsidence where the land itself will actually sink. Um, and it depends on where you are, but sometimes this can be over five feet. And this is a permanent shift in ground level. Um, so the ground will be five feet lower than it is today. So that means that the sea level will inundate and permanently cover some coastal areas, you know, up to five feet, even after the tsunami recedes. So the, as the earthquake happens, the land subsides, the elevation drops, the shoreline, the ocean immediately starts to inundate because the land has dropped. And then 10 minutes, 30 minutes, two hours, depending on where you are later, the tsunami waves arrive carrying debris and sediment. And so um, we know about tsunamis and how often they happen um, because people look at tsunami evidence. So this is a map showing where we have tsunami deposits in Washington. And I'm gonna show you an example from Discovery Bay. So this is um, a colleague of mine, a woman named Carrie Garrison Laney. She studies tsunami deposits. And so Discovery Bay is a long inland bay. It's a perfect catchment for waves. It's a tidal marsh. And so um, it's a great place to study tsunami deposits because it tr sort of traps the waves as they travel back and forth. So if you look at, um, if you dig a pit in one of these tidal marshes, um, you can see where we have tsunami deposits in the past. And so these light gray layers that you can see that ring this pit are sands that were deposited by past tsunamis. 
And so this top one here is um, the tsunami deposit from the year 1700, our most recent Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. And then we keep going down and down and down, and these show us different deposits from different earthquakes that have generated different tsunamis. And as you map these deposits and date them around the sound, you can get an idea of was that a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, was that a Seattle fault earthquake, or some other earthquake, depending on the location of these deposits and how old they are. And we can tell how old they are because these are marshes. And so you have different marsh plants that grow as the land um, changes and evolves. And so the plants are made of carbon. And so there are roots that are found above and below these deposits. And we're able to date those roots to tell us how old these tsunami deposits are. And so it's not a perfect science. Um, and depending on how good um, the root is you can get um, sort of a wide range in ages. So that's why it says 830 to 1200 AD because we don't have an exact date on some of these. So this is an animation showing what it what we expect a wave from the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake to do as it travels throughout the Puget Sound. So the red is the water, the high water level from the sound. So it reaches the outer coast in less than 10 minutes. So this is time in hours. And it travels up and down the sound and reverberates and sloshes back and forth through canals and bays. Um, and we expect to see the wave travel all the way down to Olympia, although um, we don't expect much or any inundation from a Cascadia subduction zone tsunami in Olympia. Although we haven't done the modeling yet, so this is just based on this course resolution data, so don't hold me to that. <laughs> so it's quite remarkable to see how these waves can travel through the sound and what it means for our maritime community, our ports and harbors, and for um, people that live in low-lying areas. So we provide resources um, such as this map on the right that show tsunami inundation, where we expect tsunamis um, to inundate, as well as evacuation routes and assembly areas that we work really closely with our local um, emergency managers on to develop and get make sure that these are the routes that they want to show in the assembly areas that they have for their communities. And so, again, this information is available on our portal or our website, or you can email me, and I'm happy to share that with you if you're interested. We're also working on um, pedestrian evacuation maps that show people how long it will take them to walk out of harm's way. Um, so this is important. So this is an example from Port Angeles. If you're out on the end of the Eddie's Hook, um, it will take you longer to walk out than before the wave arrives. And so you need to run if you're on the tip of Eddie's Hook, <laughs> if you feel the earthquake. <laughs> um, and so these are, these are really valuable because our message to people is we don't expect to drive if there's an earthquake and a tsunami. You should expect to have to walk to safety, to walk to high ground because of liquefaction, because of bridges that are out, power poles could fall down, and it only takes one person trying to get out of there to cause an accident to block the whole exit route. So um, we encourage people to walk to safety and to plan on evacuating on foot and staying with a neighbor if you live in a low-lying area. Um, and so we're working on these products to tell people how long it will take them to walk to safety. Um, so Washington has five active volcanoes, uh, more than any state except for Alaska. So the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens caused $2.9 billion in damage and 57 fatalities. Um, and so these, this is a map that shows the major volcanic hazard areas, excluding ashfall. So the major area or the major area of concern for volcanic hazards are lahars. Lahars are volcanic mud flows um, that travel down the volcanoes and funnel into low-lying river valleys. Um, and so that's mainly what you see, these sort of spiderweb patterns that surround the volcano are the lahar paths from previous lahars that have happened from each of these volcanoes. And so the only place with a lahar warning system is in Pierce County, um, just so you know. So lahars inundate areas with thick deposits of mud up to 100 miles away from the volcanic source. 
Um, one of the biggest lahars that we've measured in volcanic history in Washington is the electron lahar that buried the city of Ording 30 feet deep 500 years ago. This is now changed. Um, and today that would cost over $13 billion of damage and many hundreds if not thousands of lives. Um, so our goal is to provide information to the public, to you, to um, to enable risk reduction so that we can hopefully mitigate the hazard. We can't stop earthquakes from happening or volcanoes from erupting or tsunamis from happening. Um, but let's try and limit the value and the vulnerability. So how do we do that? How do we make those changes? Um, so by understanding the geology and providing people with geologic data, um, it lets us have effective planning and legislation, which hopefully will lead us to a better prepared and a safer state. Um, so this is a map, a little timeline. Um, so one of the most frequent geologic disasters in Washington are landslides. Um, so this is a timeline of lands, major landslides in Washington history, starting from the Bonneville landslide, which blocked the Columbia River. It's one of the most massive landslides in Washington um, in the, about the year of 1500. And then the Cascadia subduction zone triggered numerous landslides and caused some tsunamis, and it was quite a mess. Um, and then moving all the way forward um, until the Oso SR530 landslide in 2014. Um, so we have um, quite a few records of major landslides in Washington history. Um, but they're very difficult to predict or quantify. So we can tell you where landslides have happened in the past, and that gives us an idea of where they might happen in the future. Um, but what, just like most geologic hazards, we don't have a magic button that will tell us when or how far they will go. Um, and landslide damage is not usually covered by insurance, which is um, a major problem for people who build and live in landslide hazard zones. So we have a great landslide hazard program that was developed after um, the Oso landslide happened um, and funded by legislature. Um, where we're systematically going through county by county where there's avail highly um, detailed LIDAR information and mapping these landslides. So this is an example of a landslide and we're mapping where the scarp is, where the landslide came from, the deposits and other internal scarps, um, and what we know about them. And this is a really valuable tool for planners. So as people want to build a new house on this landslide, the planners can take this and say, nope, can't build a house there because this is a landslide, and that ultimately helps to save lives, or people want um, you know, to know if they live on a landslide, so that what can they do to help mitigate that? Um, this is a really valuable tool for that. Um, so we recently produced a homeowner's guide to landslides in partnership with Oregon, and I have some out front um, that helps you understand landslide triggers, areas prone to landslides, signs of landslide activity, and how to reduce your risk. Um, we also, after the OSO event, got funding to conduct, um, to make the Washington Geological Survey LIDAR program. I've hinted at LIDAR before, um, but it stands for Light Detection and Ranging. So an airplane flies over an area and shoots lasers at the ground, and the time it takes those lasers to return tells us about how far the ground is beneath it, which can tell us about the detailed topography and elevation. Um, and so. On the left, it, you kind of see the top image is pretty grainy. You can kind of make out what's going on. That was an old digital elevation model. And then it gets better and better and better. And the first one is, or the most forward one, is a LIDAR, what we call hill shade, or a bare earth model that shows us what the ground looks like if you strip off the trees. And so by being able to sort of see through the trees, we can learn so much about Washington geology. Because as you can imagine, when you go out in the forest, it's really hard to see rocks. Um, even if you dig a pit and you dig into the ground, you don't always get to see what's really going on beneath the weathered and erosion surface. And so by being able to strip off the trees and see the ground, we're able to understand a lot. So the next several slides I'm going to show you are um, how we use LIDAR to investigate geologic hazards. So this is um, Whatcom County. If you strip off the trees, you can really see how these bedding deposits form the perfect formation, or the perfect sort of slide for these landslides to form. And so you can strip off the trees, and then you can use some cool coloring to show where that landslide deposit is. But if you didn't have LIDAR, it's pretty hard to see that through the trees. 
And so this is an example. This is what we had before LIDAR, a 10 meter digital elevation model. This is what it looks like with LIDAR, so much more detail. And then if you have a detailed scientist look at it, you can start to pick out the different landslide features. So LIDAR really helps us to understand. And then again, if you just look at the aerial imagery, you probably wouldn't be able to see that. <laughs> And then last one, um, this is the Cedar River area where there's just a number of landslides that are coming off the cliffs. But if you didn't have LIDAR, it'd be hard to know that. And so LIDAR also helps us to see different fault zones. This is the Sadie Creek Fault Zone um, up on the northern side of the Olympic Peninsula. This is one of the most recent faults that geologists have discovered in Washington as an active fault. Um, and so just add that one to the list. <laughs> so I don't know if you can see, it's a little more difficult to see these fault scarps than you can um, the landslides, but it's a massive fault that has offset the ground and shifted it so you can pick that out. But without LIDAR, you wouldn't be able to see that through the trees. You'd have to be a really lucky geologist to just happen to find that scarp in the field. This is the um, Saddle Mountain Fault Zone by Lake Cushman. So there's different fault zones that just scream through the topography. And some geologists map these before LIDAR, but we didn't necessarily know the extent of them. And we can see a much better picture of them when we're able to see the LIDAR. And this is the Seattle Fault Zone that I was talking about many times before. And so Bainbridge Island is here, this little point. And so this is the scarp that crosses Bainbridge Island that I'll show you next. And you can also see on the south side there as well, another strand of the Seattle Fault. So this is what it looks like with just aerial imagery. And that's what I showed you before. This is the Darrington Devil's Mountain Fault Zone um, in northwestern Washington. And again, these are just major faults that cross east-west through the area. We can also use change detection or different differences in LIDAR over time to show us how landscapes evolve and change. So this is um, an animation showing the dome growth in Mount St. Helens from 2002, 2004, 2009, and then the glaciers that formed afterwards around the um, dome in the inside of Mount St. Helens. And then we can use LIDAR and this imagery to show us, sort of make these powerful images that show us where um, the hazards are and what that means for at-risk communities. So this is draping over the hazard layer over LIDAR to show the expected lahar paths um, from Mount Rainier. And then this is pretty cool. These are some really young lava flows in Skamania County, just north of Wind River. So you can actually see them in the aerial imagery, but by using the LIDAR, you can pick out different flows um, that have happened over time. And then these are Mount Adams lava flows. This is showing um, what tsunami inundation will look like um, from our model Cascadia subduction zone event um, at Cape Disappointment. So taking the terrain and then overlaying the expected tsunami inundation over it. And then, um, as I showed you before, river channel migration. So where have rivers gone in the past? And helps us to decide where they might go in the future and what that means for floodplain mapping and flooding hazards. And it's just gorgeous. <laughs> And then this is the Skagit River channel migration over time. And then this is um, showing some glaciers at Mount Rainier. We can use LIDAR to pick out glacial features. And so all of, um, we also have a LIDAR portal. So all of this data is available to the public. So you can type in your address and see what the LIDAR looks like at your house or just zoom around to different areas. You can download it or just check it out online. Um, it's pretty cool to see and 
really zoom in and so as, the further you zoom in the higher resolution it will get just so you know so if you're zoomed out it doesn't look as clear but if you zoom in it'll get more clear so the Washington geological geological survey and um, we provide you with information and assessments on geologic hazards, geologic mapping, energy mining and minerals, um, popular geology, um, publications, data, LIDAR, emergency preparedness, and we're launching a really cool new campaign for geotourism. Um, so stay tuned on that. Maybe I'll come back and give another presentation next year. Um, we're doing something called the Washington 100, 100 cool geologic features across Washington, and we're highlighting different things um, so that people can learn about them. It's pretty neat. So that's all I have prepared today. Thank you for letting me come and speak to you. I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Someone, yes. Um, this has really uh, been a fantastic presentation. And it brought up some things in my mind. I spent a lot of time in Hawaii. And uh, <coughs> Hawaii is having trouble with this sort of thing all the time, particularly on the large island that's closest to the uh, US. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, we have different types of volcanoes here than Hawaii. Oh, sorry. Um, his question was, um, do we have similar types of volcanic activity that's happening in Hawaii? Um, do we have new volcanoes forming underwater? Um, and is that something that we see here in Washington? Is that correct? Um, and so my answer is um, Hawaii has a different type of volcanoes than we have here in Washington. Those are major what we call shield volcanoes and here in Washington we have stratovolcanoes and they're formed by different processes. Um, so Hawaii volcanoes are formed by a hot spot, sort of a magma chamber underneath the plate, um, whereas our volcanoes in Washington are again formed by subduction. So we don't have the same type of volcanoes that they have in Hawaii. So we're not worried about um, necessarily offshore volcanoes that we don't know about. Yeah. Earlier this year, they were tracking, uh, uh, trying to project that landslide east of Yakima. I don't yeah. know exactly the name of the ferry or town. Yeah. Um, what's the status on that? Is yeah. So the question was, um, there's a landslide we call the Rattlesnake Hills landslide out by Yakima, and he was wondering what the status is on that. Um, so it's been slowly, slowly moving about a foot a week. It hasn't failed yet. Um, um, but it's just slowly sliding. Yeah, it's still moving. Um, there has been um, some renewed activity in the last couple weeks where there's a new area that's um, being active or bulging, but um, we're just continually monitoring it. Um, they increase the amount of monitoring from the new activity, but we have weekly calls and we monitor it every day and night and we're just sort of staying tuned. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, um, so his question was, for the Seattle Fault, what's the tsunami probability for downtown Olympia? Um, the simple answer is we haven't modeled that yet. Um, so we don't actually know. Um, we don't, I don't, so I, we don't know what the tsunami hazard will be from a Seattle Fault event. It's on our to-do list. Um, there, the, from the course resolution modeling, there will likely be wave activity, but we don't expect there to be um, much, if any, tsunami inundation. Um, but for people out in the water, um, there will be strong currents. Um, but we have to still do detailed modeling to really understand the hazard here. I'm going to have to close things down because of time, but I okay. want to thank you so much for <laughs> yeah. coming. And you're definitely going to be welcome back. <laughs> okay, and I just want to remind everyone there are some cool volcano postcards and posters and things out in the front, so make sure and grab those on the way out. Thank, thank you. you. Our next, our next talk will be Thursday, November 8th 
and that is called Nothing Worthwhile is Easy, an Early History of St. Martin's University. Father Peter Tynan will be here, so uh, get here early and we'll let you in at 11.30 unless it's snowing and raining and then we'll let you in maybe 11.20. <laughs> Bring your umbrellas. Anyway, thank you for coming so much.